just waiting for a moment for the doors to close because the sun on the building there makes it, you just look like a whole chorus of angels in this light. <laughs> there's one word we're going to look at today. And there's one image that we're going to look at. The word is, is choose. And the image is crossroads. In the first, what's going on in here? <laughs> I'm sorry, what? They're going to turn on the, off. It's like a liturgy of the fans and the door and everything else. Are we good now? All right. Lord Jesus, help us with these fans. All right. In the first lesson, we are nearly on the last day of Joshua's life. He has taken the Jews all through the Promised Land. He's defeated the Jebusites, Gergesites, Amorites, Hittites, and all the ites. No more ites. They're all gone. And just as he's about ready to let go of this life, he gathers them all together and says, on this day, you need to choose. He knows that when he goes, that they're going to be a flock of sheep biting on each other. It happens without leadership sometimes. He knows they're going to be confused, that they're going to get lost, and he says, now wait, time, time, time. Right now, right here, what are you going to choose? Are you going to choose God? Are you going to choose yourself? Are you going to choose community? Are you going to try to choose to do what you want to do? Now, while he's doing this, we need to know what he has in mind. What he has in mind is that he has a picture in his mind of Moses, his mentor, who said the exact same things at the end of his life. On the other side of the promised land, Moses isn't going to get there. He's going to send them forth, and he's worried about them. So he gathers them all up and says, I stand before you, and I give you life or death. Choose God, and you'll be choosing life. If you do not choose God, you will die. And that's not just physical death, that's emotional death, psychological death, spiritual death. So what are you going to do? Now in the gospel lesson, it's another crossroads moment. Up until this point in chapter 6 of John, he's very popular, he's doing miracles, he's casting out demons, he's feeding them the 4,000, the 5,000, everybody thinks this is, this is the Messiah of the free lunch. And then he says, don't work for the bread that I've been giving you. Work for the bread of eternal life. And if you work for that bread, you need to give me your life. In fact, you're not here to consume. You are here to empty out your life so that you can take me into it and you can be my disciple. And today is the day. And what happens is the crowds are shrinking and the disciples are kind of wandering away. They're kind of going out the back door, hoping no one will see them. And then he says to them, do you also wish to go away? Really? In other words, choose this day what you will do. To a very large degree, the quality and the trajectory of our lives depends upon the choices we make. We can't always choose what happens to us. Anybody ever been surprised by something that happens in your life? You know, you're different than any other people I've ever talked to. We can't choose. We would never choose many of the things that happen to us. But we can choose to a very large degree how we respond. It's not about what happens. It's about how we choose to react to what happens is where the spiritual work really is. I know you know people who 
the exact same circumstances happen to them respond in very different ways. Somebody grows up in a dysfunctional family. I'm still waiting to meet the functional family, but <clears throat> a different sermon. <laughs> With alcoholism and acting out and sometimes abuse, and this child at some point says, no, that's not my life. I'm going to get help, support, get God, and recover and live into health. And then there's another child who just, well, this is who I am, and my mother and daddy made me do it, and I'm just stuck, and, you know, what was, what was me? And, and they can continue and perpetuate the brokenness of this family. Somebody is cheated upon in a marriage, partnership. This one gets help, tries to learn what happened, tries to mature and heal, and maybe, hopefully, has another chance at love. This one just gives up. Just gives up on trust, on love, on commitment. They, uh, I'm done. This, somebody has mental health issues. This one says, you know, my life is not working very well. And they choose to get some help. This one knows that they're not working very well, but thinks that they can sort of dig themselves out of this well, and I'm not fine, I'm just fine, I don't need any help. And, you know, if I, if I say I need help, that means I'm crazy, and I'm not crazy, so... And they just choose to do this, very often spiraling down. Our choices are really important. Now, I believe everything I've just said. I try to say what I really believe, but I need to add something else. Because more needs to be said. Most of us here, if you're the exception, let me know have had a season or time in our lives where it feels impossible to choose. We're so battered, we're so emptied out, we're so lost, we've been so abused or lied to or betrayed that we're so stunned we don't know what to choose or where to go or what to do. And we're paralyzed. We're stuck. Now, what do we do then? This place of being paralyzed and stuck is exactly where the disciples are in today's gospel lesson. They feel like they're, you know, in the middle of a circus and they're going to be in charge. They're the senior and junior warden of this whole thing. <clears throat> and people are, are walking away and the disciples are slinking away. And Jesus has said some things that they don't like. He has challenged them in ways that they don't want to hear. He has told them it's not what you think. It's, it's over here. You've got to choose this way of life. And they don't know what to do. They see everybody leaving and they kind of looking at themselves and say, what are we going to do now? And in the middle of that moment, Jesus says to them, do you also wish to go away? And they don't know how to respond. And then he says this, have you forgotten that I have chosen you? They think they're the only people who are making the choice. Jesus says, I trump you. It's me who makes the choice. And that tips the balance. So instead of leaning away, they, well, like, okay, they're leaning towards. What Jesus did for them, he does for us. You are chosen. Now, you might wonder what kind of standards Jesus has to choose you. His only standard is love. His only standard is, is, our, is our need. 
How would your life change if you walked around and says, I'm chosen by Jesus? How, how, how would it change? How's that feel? I'm chosen by Jesus. How's that feel? I can see you're really excited about that. All right. <laughs> this is going to be a sermon series starting here. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to crack this one. <laughs> that doesn't mean that uh, Dakota's not chosen. Now, that's always a problem. You're not... Okay, well, then I won't get near here. <laughs> it doesn't mean that if I'm chosen, that God can't choose Dolores as well. Of course. And we get into trouble when I think I got a little bit more blessing than uh, Brian does. Of course, I come next to Brian to get a little more blessing from him. <laughs> Welcome. Come on in. No, no, come on in. There's a seat right here with, next to Lorna waiting for you. Are you good right there? All right. You don't need to back out. <laughs> That's not what the sermon's about. <laughs> All right, if you lived with, I am the chosen of God, what would that help you to do? It'd help you to choose. One, two, three, bless you, Dakota. All right. <laughs> Bless you, Dakota. You, you, is that, you, you got one more? Are you good? You, you're good? All right. <laughs> if you know that you are chosen by Jesus, it would help you to choose God and not anything else. If you know that you are chosen by Jesus, you'd be able to choose life and not death. If you believe that you were chosen by Jesus, you would choose heaven and not hell. And heaven and hell are current realities. We know what heaven feels like, and we know what hell feels like. And sometimes we can be there and don't know how to get out. Jesus gives us, by his grace, the power to choose heaven. If we knew that we were chosen by Jesus and held fast to that, we would choose gratitude rather than a life of discontent and whining. If we know that we are chosen by Jesus, we would love our life and not despise it. And how much time I've spent with people who despise their life like it's some kind of imposition upon them. If we know that we are chosen by Jesus, we would not look for what we don't like and how we disagree and all the things that separate us. We would look at the things that we hold in common. And all too often, church fights are around nothing that matters. All we need to do is say, we're the, we're the chosen ones of God, and things come together. There's one last cross hole, crossroads, crosswords, crossroads. Oh, man. I've been doing crosswords lately to help me. <laughs> and Luke, you can see I need a lot of help. Huh? <laughs> There's one last crossroads to face. Joshua, Moses, Jesus and us. Every one of us right now stands at a crossroads. What will you choose? One is death. One is life. Remember, at those crossroads, and we have them every one of us, every day. Remember that we're the chosen ones of God. And when we do, we'll have the grace to make the choices for life and hope and courage and joy and love. Amen.
Let us stand and proclaim our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God. The prayers of the people are form six, found on page 392 in the Book of Common Prayer. In peace we pray to you, Lord God, for all people in their daily life and work. We pray for all the people of Ukraine. May peace come. We pray for those who have lost their lives and for those who mourn in Israel. We also pray for the innocent people of Gaza, for those who have died and those suffering and in fear for themselves and their loved ones. We pray for our military personnel, especially those of this parish, for Sarah, Dylan, Joshua, and Timothy. We pray for our homebound members, including Lily, Erlene, and Eileen for this community, the nation, and the world. For the just and proper use of your creation. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. We pray for Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, for Michael, our presiding bishop, for Sean, our presiding bishop-elect, for Thomas, our bishop, James, our priest, and for all bishops and other ministers. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation, we pray for the sick, injured, or distressed. For Sophia, the Roy family, Connie, and Pang, and for those who have requested continuing prayer. Hear us, Lord. We offer prayers of thanksgiving for those celebrating birthdays during this coming week, including Jessica, Odie, Michael, and Mark. We give thanks for the altar flowers given this week by Cindy Lufkin, to the glory of God and in memory of Alvina and Maurice Taylor, and Evelyn and Lowell Lufkin. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King. We pray for all who have died, that they may have peace, have a place in your eternal kingdom. We pray for Claudette Roy, for those who have died in the wars in Ukraine, and in the Holy Land, and for all others who died this week. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Amen. 
Have mercy upon us, most, most merciful Father. Father. In, In your, your compassion, compassion forgive us our sins, sins known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all of your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please have a seat. Odie, did I, did I hear it's your birthday this week? Next week? Next week? You, you want to be prepared for today or next week? Next week. Next week. All right. Okay. <laughs> anybody, anybody else have a birthday we need to be praying for, with, anniversaries? That's right. Yeah. Don, help us out here. Look, look like you're really happy to be coming forward. <laughs> Let us pray. Lord God, we give great thanksgiving for Don and Claudia, for their many years together, for how you brought them together to be a blessing, not only to each other, but to their families and to all of us. We thank you for all the many ways that you work in their gracious spirits and generous hearts to make such a difference for your church and for your kingdom. May your blessing, your peace, your love uphold them this day and always. Amen. Stand right there. Look like smile. <laughs> Kiss your bride. Kiss your bride. Come on. There you go. All right. Yeah. The peace of the Lord be always with you. We've had so many other hiccups here that, that that's you know, it's all good. The only announcement I, I have is I want to put in front of you a really important day, and that's what we're calling Rally Day and Ministry Fair, which is going to be happening in three three weeks. So why are we going to do this? We're going to do Rally Day because well it's Maine in the summertime, and there are some people who forget the church is still open. <clears throat> And I know you've got family, I know you've got guests, I know you've got visitors, and I know you've got camps, and I know you've got that nice lake, and I know that God is everywhere, yes indeed. And I also know it's really important for us to gather here. It's not only important for us individually, it's also important for the community. Because there's a spiritual missing that we have when we don't see each other. 
Now, the ministry part of this, and you're going to hear more about this, I suspect, is that who are the ministers of the church? We are. And when does ministry begin? Baptism. Not ordination. Don't let any ordained person be the minister for you. Bad model. And if anybody, anybody ordained ever says something like that, you need another ordained person. That's spiritual malpractice. Ministry begins in baptism. We're all called into ministry, and life is ministry. And it's also important that everybody here understands that somewhere, somehow, your name is on it. Otherwise, we have the same six people doing everything, and they, they start chewing on each other and get burned out and run away from the church and run away from Jesus. So for the sake of their spiritual life and our spiritual lives, every person here has got a place with your name on it. And if we're not doing something you're called to do, then you come see me, and if it helps us to know and share the love of Jesus, I'm saying yes to you. I promise you, you don't have to go through two years of committees. <laughs> and now let us walk in love. <laughs> As Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. Amen.